everyone for joining us for our final um, talk. I'm really excited for tonight's discussion. Um, as for those who have joined us before, um, you'll, you'll know that we um, have been focusing on the Slow Food USA Manifesto and Equity, Inclusion, and Justice. And tonight, and we'll be speaking on, or we'll be talking about justice um, and what that means. Um, I'm really happy to have um, Tulare Watkins II, um, Michelle Azermayan, hopefully I pronounced that right, um, and then DeAndre Smiles um, as well joining us um, later this evening. Um, and for those who, again, have been um, following us along this whole time, this has been part of our Celebrate the, Han the Hands That Feed You um, program that we've been doing uh, at the start of uh, Terra Madre, which was also canceled because of COVID. Um, and so again, just thank you for joining us for the previous um, events. This is the first time that we've tried doing a different version of our annual fundraiser. Um, and so if you participate, especially with um, our uh, Celebrate the Hands That Feeds You dinner, with Columbus Food Adventures and their trust fall. Um, we're really appreciative of you taking the time to be part of that. Um, and again, for joining us tonight in, in this final event. Um, so for the, first, for the first two meetings, we had talked about, um, again, the manifesto focusing on equity and inclusion. And we had gone through the first um, 16 principles. And so I just have here on, this, on the screen right now, um, the final eight principles, many of which um, are in reference to Slow Food Turtle Island and different ways that we can try and engage with um, indigenous and Native American communities. Um, and so as we're approaching these topics tonight, um, I encourage you to just think about other ways outside of the food system that you might be able to include equity, inclusion, and justice principles or commitments in your own daily life. Um, so it's not just within the context of the food system um, that we can recognize the value of age diversity, making sure that we're including um, younger farmers and younger members in our organizations. Um, looking to the wisdom of people who have committed their lives towards this kind of work. Um, and again, trying to connect with um, indigenous populations as best as we possibly can. Um, and so these are the remaining principles. And so just things that I'd like you to take a look at and think about um, as we go through this. Um, because we have um, quite a bit to get through, I'll, we'll just jump into our first, um, our first uh, speaker, uh, Taylor Watkins II, um, and I'll unmute him and as we, um, I'll mute him and get him all set up. As Tyler was speaking, and then as well as for Michelle and DeAndre, if you all have any questions, um, please feel free to put that into the chat box um, or save your questions for the end for our Q&A, and we'll try and get to as, to as many and all of them as possible. All right, go ahead, Tyler. OK, thank you. Hi, my name is Tyleria Watkins, and today I want to talk to you about food justice and why it's important to me and why it should be important to you, too. But before I do that, I want to give a little background about my story. I started my business when a Cub Scout project ended. We grew cat grass and basil, and it was so interesting, I wanted to keep growing stuff. Then my parents wondered, were you growing in the winter? And I said, mushrooms, because mushrooms can grow in the dark. I'd also like to show you a clip of when I was on a Columbus neighborhood special. Hi, my name is Hilaria Watkins, and my business is called Tiger Mushroom Farm. <laughs> My first meeting at Cub Scouts, I grew cat grass and basil. It was so interesting. I wanted to keep growing stuff. Then my parents wondered what could we grow in the winter, and I said mushrooms because mushrooms can grow in the dark. So we did some research because we were like mushrooms. Like who knows anything about growing mushrooms? So we bought a box kit, about yay high, put it on the kitchen counter, watched it grow. Everyone in the family loved it, and so we tried different types of mushrooms, different varieties: lion's mane oyster, uh, portobello, white button, and we fell in love with shiitake and oyster mushrooms. We figured out that shiitake needed to be in a cold environment and oyster needed to be in a hot environment. And our basement was really cold and our spare bedroom was really hot. are um, blocks made from sawdust. We put high helium on it and we have to water it every day so the mushrooms will grow. And so the myceliates um, in about 17 days and it starts to pin. And so once it starts to pin, we make sure the humidity is right, make sure the temperature is right and the lighting in the basement is perfect for it. It loves the environment. 
Um, and about 17 days at the end of that, they just, you know, it's ready for us to harvest them. They kind of umbrella out a little bit. You want to get them before they start to curl up because that means you let them stay too late. So we get down here every day and monitor and make sure we harvest the ones that are ready. We harvest twice in the morning and in the evening time. Like these side dust blocks, they're just starting maybe seven days ago. So towards the end, when they're ready to be harvested, the spores will be in the air. I mean, it's almost like these cloud, a cloud. And so you need to have the mask on to make sure that you're not breathing in the spores because it may cause some type of infections in your lungs and things like that. We grew too many mushrooms and we couldn't eat them all and, and they would rot. So we thought that we could sell them at North Market. Well, you have to have a vendor's license and then you have to have insurance. So we said we might as well make it a small business. And he was a Tiger Cub Scout. So that's where the name came from, Tiger Mushroom Farms. I have a question. Um, how do you grow these? We grow shiitake from my basement. So what are the requirements for growing them in your basement? My shiitake grow from sawdust blocks made from sweet gum and oak. Going to the markets has really taken them away from the home and being on video games and all of that. So they're out in the open. Um, they're meeting new people, meeting different people, having conversations. I love it. And they're telling him stories and he's telling them stories. So it's just really good to see him just, you know, venture out. And also for my daughter, which is a little, little shyer than he is, for her to see her confidence level go up as well as talking and selling at the market. Hello. Like to try a sample. And then rejection was one of the things that at first I was a little, you know, concerned about because people come by and they say, no, no, no. And I thought it would affect them. So at first I was like, ah, but you know what we talked about? You know what? That's life. You know, you're going to get rejection. And so they deal with it perfectly, I would say. It's a way to eat the mushrooms. We started out in one market and then another market. And then people were asking us to bring more mushrooms and come to more markets. And so we're trying to expand. I would like to build a big giant factory to sell mushrooms all around the world. Our next step is trying to maybe get a warehouse and grow mushrooms in there so that we can, you know, supply the demand. I would love to grow morel. A lot of people, when they come to the market, they'll ask us, oh, do you guys have any morels? I'm like, no, that's his goal now to try to grow morels. So we'll further along, I guess, experiment and look into it some more and see if um, in the future he can grow morels. We can cut up these pink oyster get bow tie pasta um, and get some alfredo sauce and some tomatoes and spinach and cut those up and put it in and, and cook it. That, it tastes so good. We are doing this full time now. This is a business that we're trying to help our son grow and it's something that we will give to him once he's 18 and when he's ready to take it over. We supported him he had that first little dream of having a mushroom farm. We didn't know anything about it, so it's like a learning curve for us, but it was something he was passionate about. We said, well, we're going to try it, and it just got bigger and bigger, and so we said, hey, let's roll with it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very Thanks much. So much. I also hope to get have my mushroom seasoning line in stores soon. Now let's talk about food justice. There are lots of definitions, but I like this one. Food justice is fair access to fresh, healthy, affordable food and fair wages and treatment of those who harvest the pear and serve it. It covers everyone, right? According to the USDA, more than 11 million children in the United States live in food insecurity homes. I have worked with No Kid Hungry and Food Rescue to do something about ending hunger. I have a Friendsgiving with No Kid Hungry every year to raise awareness and funds to help end hunger. I volunteer with Food Rescue US by delivering unsold food from restaurants to local food banks. This summer, the Garden Club Project delivered over 2,000 pounds of fresh produce to the Broad Street Pantry. 
I've also grown vegetables in my own raised garden beds and donated the produce to local food bank and to a local food bank and volunteer with local matters. I love to share my love of growing mushrooms and helping in Tunger with kids. They always have great questions about mushrooms. And when they say they, when I have samples, it's always funny when they say they hate mushrooms, but end up liking the plant. I also had the great opportunity to meet one of my role models in California, Ron Finley, the gangster gardener. We were on a panel about the future of farming. And next time I visit California, he has invited me to his community garden. I love visiting community gardens and harvesting. Two potatoes are fun to harvest. You never know what size or shape you get until you pull it out. These kids were so excited to harvest their sweet potatoes. Some of them had never tried one and they were excited to take it home and try it. I was so excited to finally have my nonprofit and help my local community. Here's a quick video that shows some things I've done so far with the Garden Club project. Hi, I just wanted to thank you all for believing in me and donating money for the Big Give fundraiser. Here's some things I got to do because of your donations. You can be motivated at any age. This is me at Rotary Club. Also, here are some ways you can help with food justice. Grow food in your community garden and donate it to a local pantry. Start a community garden. Volunteer at a community garden. Share information about local farmers markets and food pantries. Or 
hold a canned food drive and donate it to a local pantry. Dream big and believe big. If I can do it, so can you. Thank you. And here's social media for my business and my nonprofit. Hey, thank you, Talaria, so much for your presentation. And right now we're um, gonna get ready for Michelle to share her screen as well now. So I'm going to unmute Michelle. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Michelle Ajamian, and I live in Southeast Ohio, which is part of the Appalachian region. And um, Southeast Ohio, Appalachia, Ohio is about 32 counties of Ohio. So it's a pretty significant part of our state. And perhaps not what we think about, or certainly none of my friends back east where I grew up think about Appalachia when they think about Ohio. So um, my project is sort of two parts, um, but the Appalachian Staple Foods Collaborative is mainly what I'm gonna talk about tonight and what it's about. So um, I've been involved in this for about 10 years and it kind of started out with um, my partner and I just wanting to know uh, what high nutrition grains and beans could grow locally and it mushroomed. <laughs> um into something else so let's see i wanted to start with gratitude and acknowledgement of the traditional lands and territories of the shawnee osage and adena and hopewell peoples of our region um, i live and work here and i very i feel very grateful for the 20 odd years i've been here and what i've learned about the land from my neighbors um, and from local people here who have roots back to the indigenous people who lived here before. Um, many people may or may not know, I just want to point out these images, um, particularly the one on your left of the Serpent Mound, which is the largest and largest um, mound in North America. And it's not very far from me, maybe about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes away. And there's a lot of lore about it and a lot of understanding and mystery about it. Um, but it's a very special place. Um, in the center, there are two contemporary women who are of Shawnee descent. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Adena Sun Temple, um, which doesn't exist anymore, but that's a uh, rendering of what it was like here in Appalachia. So what is the Appalachian Staple Food Collaborative? So um, the way that we started is we were asking the question of what would it take to build a regional staple food system in Appalachia, Ohio, or in, in a region like ours, which is quite different, as I was saying, than the rest of the state and what we think of as the Midwest. Um, and when we started out, we really didn't know um, what that would lead to for us. In fact, we had this fantasy that we were gonna be farmers. We already had a farming background, but we never grew grains and other staples, but that we would farm and develop some of these crops for people in our region because there's tremendous food insecurity here. We're among the poorest counties in the country. And we saw a lot of small plots of land that weren't really growing food. And we thought, what if it was growing, what if that plot was growing protein and uh, corn and beans and other crops that would help give people better nutrition? Um, so why we're doing this, I, I've already addressed that a little bit, but you know, kind of how we got started. But as we dug in and as we got started, um, we learned more than the impetus that got us here. Um, and what we learned is that, um, you know, 1.5 billion acres of land was stolen from indigenous in this country and many, many um, hundreds of thousands of people were kidnapped from Africa to come here to do labor. And between those two acts, we um, 
our country, this continent, um, and this government became extremely wealthy in a much shorter amount of time than you uh, might see in other countries around the world. And it was because of those acts that that was possible. Now, fast forwarding, um, and I don't want to gloss over that, but fast forwarding to kind of more contemporary times, we have lost um, a lot of that local and uh, food security and food um, sovereignty, if you will, in local communities, because it, it was for, you know, over a hundred years or more that every town had a mill. Every, every, how many people live where there's a, a, a road called Mill Road or Mill Creek Road? That's because there were mills everywhere and people had in their community the means to process what they were growing. Um, that changed six, about 60 years ago and, and forward to today or to about five years ago. Um, it changed tremendously and those mills disappeared because we had large corporations that came in and um, took over that piece. So um, one of the things that we're doing currently um, with our project is on the neighbor loaves, et cetera, project. And so what we do there is we connect local. So COVID kind of inspired this and, and this was actually started by a partner organization in the upper Midwest called the Artisan Grain Collaborative. And basically it was a response thinking, wow, farmers are maybe not going to be able to sell the crop that they've put in the ground and things are going to close down. How can we help? that part while also helping people who are not going to have enough food because even more people are going to be out of work and be struggling even harder. So the idea here is that um, the baker or the restaurant agrees to use 50% local grains and beans, staple crops in a recipe and then they put that product online and their customers purchase the product. And then they accumulate X number of purchases and then they give that, that purchase away. So we kind of copycatted, you know, we were copycats of that with permission. And we um, started, I think it was in May, mid-May here in Southeast Ohio and we, um, have been working a lot with a local bakery and a restaurant here. And these loaves of bread, uh, that's uh, the Federal Hawking School District school bus. And when school was not in session because of COVID, they were sending a bus around our rural area to different places in their district and giving away food. And we were providing bread for that. Most of the bread that comes that is purchased from the bakery is being uh, distributed through a local food pantry. And they get, I don't know, 30 to 40 loaves every week. And that's been going on for, I think six months now. Um, yeah, and then we also um, worked with a restaurant who, and they make meals for a local organization that works with mental health, um, uh, people who are challenged with mental health and the gathering places, that place where they have a place where people can go, but of course, because of COVID, nobody's going there. So they are distributing food to their clients every week, uh, two or three times a week. And that's been really great to be part of that. So why grains and beans, right? You know, like, um, we know a lot about local vegetables and how important they are for our health and, and our well being, but it turns out that grain, bean, oil seeds, that's the lion's share of agriculture and it always has been. Um, so if you look at this chart, which is from 2007, which um, just to give you some perspective, this is before these crops were used for ethanol. So the now is much larger, but I have not been able to find a comparable chart. So when you look at it and you see where vegetables are, um, these are billions of dollars, right? So vegetables in 2007 were like 
oh, under 20 billion. And you know, all of these, all the way up to fruits and nuts, everything's under 20 billion. And then you get to grain and oil seeds and look at that, it's almost $80 billion. And that's not local, it's not high nutrition and it's not culturally appropriate food. And that's a very big part of food security and food sovereignty is that people get to eat what they grew up and what their ancestors grew up eating. And that has been um, changed dramatically because of the um, kind of multinational world market that is controlling grains and beans. So what about food security? Yeah, um, my partner and I actually went, We kind of how we got started with this is we were lucky enough to be traveling and working in different parts of the country and always going to farmer's markets and seeing like, this was 2008 or nine, and we were like, wow, farmer's markets have really taken off. There's a lot of local food out there. And one day he turned to me and said, yeah, but what about beans and grain? And that was the start. So without control and access to healthy grains and beans, um, how do we have health? So where does our bread come from, to use a metaphor? And it's not just bread, but I think that really works. And I love that song by culture. So I had to put that in there. Um, so there it is. You know, you can go into a grocery store and there are 30,000 plus items in the supermarket, but what's the quality of it and what, and is it really 30,000 or is it two or three crops that are made into um, the food that we wind up buying? And it's true even in food co-ops, like those of us who um, focused on local groceries and food co-ops and that kind of thing, we, we started calling uh, those places and saying, so where do your black beans come from? And we found out China or, you know, pretty far away. And with peak oil and things like that, that we're all thinking about and climate, there's not much security in depending on black beans from China, um, which is a really important cultural food for over 25% of the people in our country, just culturally. And then for the rest of us um, who may not have grown up eating black beans, we, we all eat a lot of black beans. And that's just one particular example. You know, so you can see this on the left there, you see how food, how these crops are currently being grown and, you know, chemicals that are put on them and, and irrigation um, is necessary because they're growing in places that didn't necessarily uh, grow that particular crop because the, the crops that were indigenous to particular regions of North America have been replaced by um, the big three, corn, wheat, and soy. And that leads to a lot of food insecurity. And it also is, you know, when we think about food insecurity as something that's happening globally, it's also happening locally. And we're, we're all much more aware of that now, I think with COVID than perhaps we were before. So in 2008, there was a big food shortage thing that went on. And that was right when we were starting. And you know, it was just like this coincidence. Um, there were, I think Australia had come to like 10 years of drought and rice was being rationed you know, out of Walmart and other places, places you're familiar with, um, because the rice crop, a lot of the world rice is grown in Australia, right? And so um, there were food riots, people were not getting the food they needed. There were, there were some pretty big events around hunger and lack of food that year. So um, a second project we work on is 
working with national partners. And that's like where I'm a network developer, like really connecting with people around North America who are helping regionalize and support um, regional efforts where they are around uh, growing, processing, meaning milling or seed cleaning or oil pressing, all of those things. Um, and researching the crops that are appropriate to that region. And a lot of that is, you know, connected to understanding um, how we can support indigenous people who were really behind most of the crops that we um, enjoy. Uh, I think I have a slide that will say something about that here in a second. Um, and we also put out a newsletter quarterly called the Staple Pulse, and that's our North American network newsletter to connect people to what is going on around the country. Um, and we are um, looking at developing a seed processing center with Shagbark Seed and Mill, and I am a co-owner at Shagbark. And we have, at Shagbark, we have received a planning grant to help us look at how we can really have greater impact in the community um, that connects to a white paper that we have about how can communities everywhere, regions everywhere have a processing center where all the things that happen after you clean seed can be kind of on one on campus, so to speak, so that all the shipping and receiving, all these different little businesses can share services and stuff and really get good local food out across their region. Um, another project is we're doing peer-to-peer -peer learning with um, millers from around the country. And, um, you know, because part of, Part of what needs to change is that there are people who call themselves experts who never really roll up their sleeves and do the work, you know, like, um, and there are people who are doing the work and figuring out how to run a mill, how to grow these crops, et cetera, and learning from people that know more than they know. And so we're really interested in this kind of democratic learning model where people who, um, know things and need to know more things get together and we facilitate their meeting and discussing what they know and what they need to know because the expert is the practitioner is a good way to put it. So our values are around racial and economic justice, climate strategies and sharing best practices. And I did just talk about why peer-to-peer -peer learning is important. Certainly, I think you've gotten a sense of why um, racial and economic justice is important. You know, um, I think I'd like to mention another thing. I, I did mention one and a half billion acres being stolen from indigenous people here. But then there's another thing that is important to know, um, which is after um, the Civil War, um, freed Blacks were given over 400,000 acres of land as reparation. And that land started in Charleston, South Carolina, and went south to Florida. I can't remember the name of the river. I think it was in Northern Florida, 30 miles inland. And then in just nine months, the president rescinded that order. And I really wonder what it would be like, and maybe we could all reflect on this, what would our country be like today if freed Blacks, who were the expert farmers, they were the practitioners, if they retained that land wealth and were able to grow the crops that we all enjoy? Um, I thought I'd mention one more thing, which is the crops that are native to North America, like corn and beans and peppers, tomatoes, uh, there are a lot. You know, 60% of the food worldwide depends on those crops. And the irony is that the native way of using those crops has, it's just starting to be resurrected because of the way we treated indigenous people and taking their right to their food away from them. 
and they're food ways away from them. So we could, we invite anyone who's interested to get in touch with us and work with us because volunteers and, you know, if you're geeking out about like, I think you're all anthropology folks. I, I think that learning more about how um, the history of the people here connects to our food system is really important. And that's, that's the end of my presentation. I'm sure you'll have some questions. Thank you. Great, and thank you so much, Michelle, for, for that presentation. Um, I also wanna, as we're um, transitioning to our final speaker, um, I just wanted to also uh, make sure to mention that um, Michelle and her partner, Brandon, um, through Shagbark were the, were the uh, 2017 Snowblazer um, Award recipients that, um, Slow Food Columbus puts out, and so we're really glad to have Michelle here, especially um, with this regional work that you do um, in your area that definitely transcends and reaches um, us here in Central Ohio and beyond. So um, thank you for that as well. Um, so our final presenter is um, DeAndre Smiles. Um, and so I'm gonna have, um, let's see here, I'll unmute DeAndre and um, perfect time for him to join us here and have him share his screen whenever he's able to do that. All right, let's do that ASAP. We'll have to stop your screen sharing, Mark Anthony. I'm very yep. sorry about that. That's fine. Go for it. <laughs> All right. There we go. Can everybody hear me? Somebody give me a verbal cue. We can hear you. You can hear me great. Yep. All right. Uh, Bonjour. Deandre Smiles and Disney Kaz. Indonesian Nabeu. Awaz is seen and do them. Gaz Gasqua Jimmy Kog on Jibawag in Dino Maganag. I always take any opportunity that I can at any presentation that I do to introduce myself in my people's native language, Ojibwe Moin. What I said is hello, my name is DeAndre Smiles. I am of the Bullhead clan. My I'm Anishinaabe or Ojibwe, and my family comes from a place in north central Minnesota called the Leech Lake Reservation. Uh, originally from Minneapolis, grew up in Minnesota for the first 26 years of my life, and then I got admitted into the geography PhD program at some school out east called the Ohio State University. So I came out, did a, did a PhD in geography, and now I'm a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of History. So I'd like to thank you all for attending this talk this evening and for sharing some time with me to talk to you about my presentation, which is called Wild Rice and Ojibwe People in an Era of Climate Crisis. And let's begin. So the story that I want to tell you is, first of all, it's, it's about wild rice at a very, very overarching level. But wild rice is extremely important to me. You see there, there's a couple of bags of our Leech Lake wild rice, which is the best wild rice on the face of the planet. I might be a little biased, but that's OK. Uh, we sell it on our homeland. Um, every time I get to go home to do some field work, I, I purchase some. And I bring it back with me here in central Ohio. And it's a little, it's, a, it's like a little piece of home for me. Um, as somebody that grew up in Minnesota and has deep ties to Minnesota and deep ties to water and to the land, it's always nice to have a little bit of the fruit of our tribe's labors with me. And as you can see here, I often like to share it. Um, in the geography department, we oftentimes had departmental potlucks and I would bring wild rice to eat and it was usually a pretty good hit. I've, I've gotten a lot better at cooking wild rice. There's actually an art to doing it. You know, you have to make sure that you're you're boiling it for enough time and letting the kernels open up and adding some butter and some salt. And I, I'm, I'm making myself hungry talking about this. I can tell you all about the culinary values of wild rice. And this is a talk about food. So it would per be perfectly in place. But I want to maybe take a little bit of a different tack from perhaps the last few talks. I apologize that I that I came in late. Um, but what I really want to talk about is the ways that food and climate change and environmental justice can overlap. And I want to start by telling you a little short version of our creation story. And this will make a lot of sense when I'm finished, I promise. And so in the Ojibwe creation story, the idea was that the Creator flooded the earth because 
the living beings of the earth were not living in harmony with one another. They were not being kind to one another and they are not helping to lift each other up. And so a great flood covered the earth and a group of animals helped to build the new earth on top of the back of the turtle. And the animals swam down into the flood that covered the earth and each one brought up a piece of mud and put it on the turtle's back. And eventually they created what we call Turtle Island. The, the story itself would be beautiful. It would take the entire presentation time I have today to tell it. But basically the, the point of the story is that, um, you know, the animals created Turtle Island and the animals came first and then the plants and the other animals and the waters and the lakes and the streams came second and then humans came last. And that's important because it, in our worldview, it means that we are not the most important beings on the face of the planet. We are, we are the least important and the water and the plants and the animals that are our relatives are our kin happen to be as important, if not more important. So to be a good Ojibwe person in order to live your life by Ojibwe life ways is to be able to make sure that you're, you're protecting your more than human kin with as much vigor as you would your human relatives. And so I wanna turn a little bit here. So I wanna bring you back to my home state of Minnesota. And this is us, the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe here. But you notice the Anishinaabe or Ojibwe reservations make up the northern part of the state. And I don't know how many of you have been to Minnesota, but it is the land of 10,000 lakes. And the Anishinaabe territories in the north are no different. We're surrounded by huge forests and thousands of lakes and rivers. And when I zoom in a little bit closer to the Leech Lake Reservation, it is the same way. We are surrounded by, I, I feel, probably one of the most beautiful places on the face of the planet, and, and I am openly biased here, about the, the, just the, the clear lakes and the, the peaceful forests. And as you can see on the right here, the very, very extensive beds of wild rice. So wild rice, or as we call it in the Ojibwe language, monomen, is an extremely important crop to the Ojibwe people. But it's in danger, and I want to kind of take a step back here, and I want to introduce the concept of climate change. And climate change is obviously nothing that's new to people. It's something that we that's in the public consciousness today, and we talk about it all of the time. And in academia, especially in geography and the social sciences, we are very intimately interested in the ways that climate change really creates deep, long-lasting effects at a variety of scales. So let me start here by talking about worldwide. So there, due to climate change and the melting of polar ice caps and glaciers, there are increasing sea levels, uh, especially in the Pacific Ocean. This is an area that is at extreme risk of catastrophic damage related to climate change. So in the picture on the right here is a village in the island nation of Kiribati. And Kiribati is a nation that's consisted of a couple of low-lying atolls in the Pacific Ocean that are no more than a couple of feet above sea level. And so the nation is already very intimately connected with, you know, weather-related events wreaking havoc. And because of the rising level of the Pacific Ocean, it's gotten to the point now where Kiribati has already purchased land on the island of Vanua Levu in the island nation of Fiji to relocate their population. So to, to restate this, there is already one nation that has already said because of the effects of climate change, our, our nation is going to be uninhabitable and we need to evacuate our population within the next 20 years. I, I highly recommend, there's a number of documentaries out about this and it's, it's really, really, really shocking. But I wanna take a second to zoom in a little bit closer here as we get closer back to Minnesota and Monoman. Here in North America, we've seen also really deep effects from climate change. Um, there is increasing ice or decreasing ice cover in the Arctic. The, the polar, polar ice caps are starting to melt. And this has increased danger, the danger for Arctic peoples to travel to hunt and fish. So for, for Arctic people, such as the Inuit and other Arctic peoples, um, there's these, you know, hunting and fishing and gathering are part are very deep cultural traditions. And 
that are related to food and they're having trouble being able to do this now because existing species of animals are starting to move further and further north to be replaced by other species due to trying to be close to the ice cover or the fact that predators are starting to be able to move further north now because the climate is becoming more hospitable to them. But this has really deeply catastrophic effects for Arctic cultures. So let's zoom in a little bit closer now to a little bit closer to home, the American Midwest. So I, I'm sure you're all probably familiar with what the saying, April showers bring May flowers. Well, for a lot of people that live close to the major river valleys and, and river basins in North America and in the Midwest, we also know that April showers brings May floods. And so we see that increasing temperatures and, and climate change, which are not, you know, sometimes we see that people are saying, well, you know, climate change is, in, is intrinsically connected to temperature. No, what climate change is, is, is a very, is a deviation away from the normal climatic patterns of a place. But increasing temperatures does have a bit to do with it because as Midwest, as the Midwest moves out of the spring or moves out of the winter and gets into the spring, that means that rainfall comes a lot earlier to the Midwest. Um, in increasing rainfall, which means that the rivers oftentimes can't discharge the additional runoff from rainfall quickly enough, and that leads to water getting backed up into disastrous flooding. I mean, people, you know, I'm, I'm sure probably everyone's familiar with the 1993 Mississippi River floods. Um, in Minnesota, we've had a number of, of kind of damaging floods over the last 20 years that I'm very familiar with, and I'm sure there's been amounts of flooding here in, in Ohio as well with the Ohio River. And with this disastrous flooding, it, it, it can damage crops through flooding and inundating them. But then we also take a look at the different effects of climate change that are not intrinsically rain related or actually are related to a lack of rain. So we see that, you know, times of drought that's also damage to crops and that, okay, that damages agriculture and a lot of times can trickle down to the unavailability of foodstuffs in that way. So let me focus on Minnesota a little bit here. So again, I, I love talking about Minnesota if you, if you haven't noticed, but one of the things that Minnesota has a reputation for is being extremely cold, right? Like people joke around about, you know, Minnesota is like under, under snow cover six months out of the year. And you know, in a lot of places, you might be right in certain parts of the state. So I grew up in Minneapolis, but I went and did my master's degree in a city called Duluth, which is here on the far Western end of Lake Superior. And in Duluth, you know, it used to be that you could tell that there were there were very there were four very distinct seasons. You would see you would start out in the summer that would come in about May or June when the last snow kind of melted and the ice kind of dissipated off of Lake Superior. That would go into about September, late September, when you would start to feel kind of cold temperatures and the leaves would start to change. And then the first snowfall would generally fall in about oh, I'd say like late October, early November, and you would start to transition into winter. And then you would have a very muddy and kind of mucky spring in about March or April. And then the cycle would continue. And you would see this kind of in a lot of Minnesota as well. I, I still remember as a kid, um, you know, having the first snowfall in Minneapolis in like, well, I don't know, like October. But because of increasing temperatures in the state, um, this is this has led to a shift in season duration and precipitation. And it's, you know, for example, it's made flooding more prevalent. And so, for example, in northern Minnesota, you see here that there are some parts of the state that have had an increase of average temperature of over three degrees over, you know, a period from 1960 to about 2012. And, you know, that may not seem like a huge increase in temperature. And if you ask some people in northern Minnesota, they might be like, oh, yeah, it's, it's getting a little bit warmer. I might be able to be out on the boat or, you know, out on the deck for a couple of weeks longer. But those increasing temperatures have very catastrophic effects that we have we haven't been able to anticipate but our indigenous nations are facing so for example at leech lake we see an increase of invasive species in our waters that has led to other species of you know fish and plants being basically crowded out and this has basically led to a disruption to local aquatic ecosystems and so I want to I want to kind of stop here and you know for for the longest time here now I've been talking about all these damages and kind of these ways that you know environments are, are being damaged and people are probably asking well you know are you going to be are, are we going to stay you know in this kind of dark frame of mind the entire time you know you're supposed to be talking about wild rice and I'm getting there 
Uh, I want to now kind of turn attention to the ways that my own nation has started to kind of help work with other Anishinaabe nations in northern Minnesota to help protect you know, our aquatic ecosystems and our, our land-based ecosystems and help protect Minoman. So part of it is a, a kind of a holistic approach to water quality. And what this has meant is that, you know, my tribe has had, you know, has really engaged with maintenance of existing local aquatic species. They've really sought to control and eradicate invasive aquatic species, you know, through cooperation with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And there's also really an increased effort, um, you know, both governmental and grassroots level to help safeguard water quality. And a lot of this has been in, in regard to energy production. But also, it really focuses on wild rice. So wild rice, as I've, as I've said already, is a very important culturally, very important culturally to Anishinaabe people. And it, it's a food source, right? Like, I, I'm if probably, if you haven't had, you know, wild rice casserole, you're, you're missing out. And maybe I'll, I'll send Mark Anthony a, a, a recipe to send out to the attendees if you're looking for something to kind of kind of spice up your Thanksgiving meal this year. But wild rice is, is at perilously at risk in Minnesota. It's, it's, it's at risk due to increased temperatures and water levels, which are actually really dangerous to wild rice cultivation. So in, in, you know, when we think of irrigation, we think of, you know, well, we, we want plants to get water, but you, we all know that if you overwater a plant, it will drown. And wild rice is the exactly the same way. You have to have the water at a certain temperature, and it has to be at a certain level in order for wild rice beds to thrive. And if it's not out there, then they can die off. Um, invasive species of plants, of aquatic plants, also pose a risk um, because, you know, if plants are transplanted through the ballast tanks of boats or accidentally are introduced through other ways, that can lead to crowding out of, of wild rice beds that are very fragile. And so there's really been an increased effort by my tribe and also other tribes to help protect wild rice beds. Uh, for example, this is a report that um, I, I really enjoyed reading this, and that probably shows how academic I am that I love, that I enjoy reading a dry, like, task force report. But this was a task force that was put together by tribal nations in Minnesota that said we, we are at risk of losing a lot of our wild rice beds in the state, and we need to find a way to help protect them. And so this tribal wild rice task force put together a report. Um, an, another a colleague of mine at the University of Minnesota is also involved in um, you know, a post uh, project that's helping to research, you know, the ways that they can work with tribes, the University of Minnesota can work with tribes in order to help protect, you know, wild rice. And so this is really important because, you know, cult, you know, is it kind of my, my main takeaway here is that, you know, climate change poses cultural risk and it, it poses culinary risks to Anishinaabe people. But, you know, one of the really cool things that my tribe is doing is, you know, through wild rice harvesting and through kind of the, the maintenance of wild rice beds, this is an example of increased cultural education that helps to remind Ojibwe and Anishinaabe people of their connectedness to the environment. So looking back to our creation story, where we are not the most important thing on the earth, we are just as important and less important of the animals and the plants and the water, and we need to do our best to protect them. And by doing this, I think that not only can we make sure that we, we keep ensuring that there will be delicious wild rice for generations to come, but we also are, are helping to secure a future for our people. Miigwech, gigawabamin, thank you. And I will take questions when it's time. Great, thanks so much, DeAndre, for that. Um, I could definitely um, hear you talk about climate change and food stuff um, forever, and that's uh, I'm definitely biased when it comes to that as well. Um, so I'm going to now, uh, we're gonna open it up to now our Q&A session. Um, and we should be able to set it up where um, everyone should be able to unmute yourselves at this point. Um, and we'll start off, um, we'll open it up to um, everyone at this point. I've got some questions here that I've got for the panelists, but. Um, if you all have any questions um, yourselves, uh, we'll open up the floor to you first. So if we can have the panelists um, turn your videos on at least and then um, start fielding questions. Um, and for those in attendance, if you're um, nervous and don't want to be on video again, um, feel free to use the chat um, box to type your question in, and then we'll make sure to, to share that.
So I guess as we um, wait for some questions to hopefully come in, um, I think what, what struck me, you know, whether we're talking about mushrooms or um, staple grains or, or wild rice, a lot of what um, I think the justice comes around to is making sure to find the right people to partner with. Um, and so I'm wondering if um, each of you can briefly um, share how you, um, you know, how did you come up with the strategic partners? Who are those um, people or those groups that have uh, influenced you and supported you um, in terms of the work that you're doing? Michelle, do you want to take it away? Yeah, I could do that. Um, you know, I I feel like I ask a lot of questions. And so the question of what would it take to have a food secure region, um, which led to staple foods or the missing link, um, led me to just reach out to people who might know things I don't know everything from what kind of crops we should try growing um, to, you know, who are those strategic partners? I mean, early on, I got connected with people at OSU um, just because I was looking up local food on the internet. So, but currently the strategic partners, the start of the strategic partners um, I'm working with are, are people around the country who are leading food systems work around staple foods. And I think the challenge that, and this isn't about how you find those partners, but I think the challenge that um, I've observed is that many of the food system leaders are white people. And, you know, at the very best, which isn't good enough, they may be serving indigenous and people of color, but how do we, um, how do food system leaders step out of the way? And instead of serving people who have been marginalized, putting, stepping out of the way so they can lead because they know, they know more than, um, you know, <laughs> administrators know <laughs> essentially. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I think it's just about being open to connections with people and, and reaching out and saying, hey, I'd like to know more about you. It sounds simplistic, but really that's, that's how you build relationships. It's really about, you know, good friendships and good relationships that come from common ideas and work. It's definitely that slow food step-by-step -step kind of, kind of uh, relationship building. Um, Talerio, how about you? How did you, um, who are your strategic partners and how did you get into that? Yeah. Okay, so I, um, I don't really have strategic partners in business, at least not yet. I haven't really gotten to that point of looking for strategic partners. Um, I guess in terms of um, your parents, because your mom was talking quite a bit in the in the video, right? How did you, how difficult was it to convince her to you know start this business with you? It wasn't it wasn't that difficult? She um she likes us. She wants us to like get out more and wants us to always be active and making a difference. So she was she was pretty gun ho about um starting a and when you speak to um, to other kids, do you find them to find to have that same kind of uh, motivation, or is it more challenging to get them away from the computer and all the digital stuff and actually get their hands dirty? Well, I visited most of the places I visit. They either have gardens, so it's not really that hard to get the kids to want to do something outdoors or do something active. But um, I haven't really had that struggle when talking to people, our kids, uh, trying to get them off of their phones and stuff. Great. And then um, DeAndre, do you have any um, comments in terms of um, perhaps folks in 
in your tribe or people that you're working with that have um that are doing this kind of work around wild rice Um, you know, yes, actually. So, so I mentioned that there's an interdisciplinary team at the University of Minnesota, and I actually just had an opportunity to talk with them a couple of weeks ago. It's it's a very it's a huge project that that spans the natural sciences and the social the social sciences, and it's actually led by indigenous indigenous academics that are working in in consultation with indigenous nations in Minnesota. It's like a massive it's a massive project. I think they just literally put out a call for like I think ten postdocs that. in there um and you know that that's that's in that's in um combination with the work that's already been done by tribes you know on their own i know my own tribe we have a very active wild rice seeding program and um you know going even beyond wild rice you know with fisheries we have we have our own fishery program where you're seeing people that um is this is this is the thing that really amazes me about the it, it really shouldn't amaze me but it's always like it's like kind of like an awe-inspiring i'm almost kind of like i'm like, i'm like i geek out about it the fact that you're seeing people that are really they really rely on you know kind of or like traditional e ecological knowledge in order to like run these programs but they also you know they they weave it together with like western knowledge in like a really interesting way that that's really really cool And so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of work that's going on in Minnesota, uh, you know, about this stuff. It's, it's kind of one of the, you know, one of the areas where I think there's a lot of intertribal cooperation actually is, is like in, in this area of like wild rice preservation. Great. Um, and, I, and I gotta say, DeAndre, thank you for sharing that the story of, um, you know, of the creation of the creation story that you had shared. Um, it gives us some context earlier. We had, I had mentioned um, Slow Food Turtle Island as, as a particular group that um, the Slow Food USA movement is, you know, really trying to encourage folks to partner with. And so having that kind of cultural backstory um, is definitely helpful. Um, one of the questions that has come up, um, and I don't think it's too dumb of a question, Lee, I'll, I'll call you out with that. Um, She wants to know um, what kind of measures have been successful in accommodating for climate change when growing wild rice? Um, are they using different varietals or var different variants? Are they changing their locations? Um, and for me, this is a, a kind of question that really works with um, the kind of food research that I do with um, grapes and wine. And how are we trying to adapt you know, to these kinds of changes? Um, so Deandre, I'll let you respond to that first, but I'll also expand that um, to ask Michelle and Talia to think about, you know, in terms of staple, um, staple grains or in terms of mushrooms, Um, how are um, climatic variations or weather changes affecting the work that you're seeing on the ground? Um, so, Dianj, if you have any um, insight on um, what might, you know, what are folks doing in Minnesota right now? So a lot of it actually is, is going around kind of, you know, it's these, it's this like kind of adaptation kind of framework now where it's like, well, we, you know, the climate change, if we, if we can reverse it, um it's going to be a long game it's going to kind of be the long game and in the short game what they're trying to do is yeah they're definitely doing maybe some kind of work about maybe trying to do some breeding and things like that to make it more hardy i think also you know they're really being really really vigilant about the way like what you know what um crops or what what organisms can be brought into lakes on the reservation i mean the dnr is like they're they're really super adamant about you know if you're bringing a boat onto the reservation and they have these ballast tanks and they have these tanks that fill up with water and that you empty them they're like you you empty those and you get them clean before you come into a lake on this reservation because if you bring an invasive species into here you can kill you could kill off an entire entire bed so it, it's really kind of a multi-pronged approach and it's, it's really super impressive like in, in another in another life i wondered if maybe this is the kind of work i would, <laughs> I would want to be doing myself Um, because it's just really cool. Great, thank you. Um, Michelle, anything that you've seen in terms of how folks are adapting um, the crops that they're growing? Um, hmm, that's a really good question. I definitely see a lot of anxiety among farmers. And, you know, in 2019, um, it didn't hit us in Ohio, but Nebraska, Wisconsin, um in february 2019 experienced like a flood like that had never happened before and farms that were you know three 300 400 years old were wiped out and you know that didn't really make the news and i think a really interesting thing to look at is this is headline material like having farms disappear uh, having land unable to grow the food that has been traditionally grown there for the millennia should be on the front page instead of 
something I get to dig for because I look for stuff like that. Um, in terms of adaptation, I, I know that um, there are people experimenting with dry land rice, um, which isn't uh, in response to flooding, but those dry land rices can grow in different uh, climates. And where we live in Southeast Ohio, we definitely, you know, there's this whole thing about season expansion with high hoop houses, but I think the, the um, zone expansion is something we need to think about and start to grow things in high hoop houses that will wind up being grown outside of the high hoop house as the climate, as the planet gets warmer. So we just have to be creative and try lots of things because we don't know. Nobody knows exactly what to do. I love that um, they're keeping boats from coming in with water that came from somewhere else. I think that's so important because there's been so much introduction of invasive species uh, to different bi bioregions because no one was really thinking about that. And, and finally we are. <laughs> And then, um, Tulare, have you noticed anything um, in terms of challenges with growing mushrooms? Um, I know you you haven't been growing for, you know, decades like uh, most people, um, crop growers. But have you noticed anything in, in your experience? Um, if you're talking about um, climate, uh, I grow indoors, so I get to control the climate and temperature of my mushrooms and how they experience the humidity. And everything so the climate outdoors doesn't really affect us indoor inside because i get to control all of it yeah that would be super great you know if we could have like a whole bunch of greenhouses or different biospheres to try and uh, contain all of that um one question from um colleen that came up and i think she had to leave um she wanted to know if um let's see so there are two questions that she has. Um, the first is, are there any documentaries or movies that any of you have found inspiring and useful to understand more about um, you know, climate issues or justice issues or food justice? Um, and then another question she had is, do you have arguments to frame the climate change problems in terms of pocketbook issues for regular people? So I suppose, how do we um, frame climate? You know, When we think about climate change, we might think of a climate justice model recognizing that this is an ethical thing that we need to take into account. So how do we, how do we frame that for folks? Um, so two quite different questions. So either one that you want to try and pick up or if you um, have suggestions for both. Um, well, I was just watching videos of, is it Sean Sherman? Who is, uh, he wrote the book, The Sous Chef, spelled I like the Sioux native name, even though that was something that was derogatory from the French, but I think it's a really good play on words. Um, and I really, I recommend looking him up on YouTube and seeing some of his videos. Um, one that I really, of documentary that I really like, and I'm not big on documentaries, I have to admit, um, is King Corn, which came out many years ago. And it's a very good overview of um, agriculture, GMOs, and, and what's happened with corn and how it's kind of ubiquitous in things that you wouldn't even think corn is in and it's not necessarily very good for you, the kind of corn that is, you know, industrial corn. Um, we did a newsletter, our last newsletter focused on a couple of things that indigenous people are doing around corn. And I also did a whole reading list and watch list and I could find that and paste it into the chat um, if people are interested in that. Um, but yeah, there's there are a lot of great books and great films out there. I'm more of a reader of things. So not, when I watch a film, it's usually something that's not a documentary. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Michelle. If, or if you just email that to me later and maybe we can pair that up with um, the recipe that DeAndre mentioned if he um, finds one for wild rice for us. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll send you that newsletter because it has some really interesting things about corn and the way nitrogen was, um, well, in 2018, if I can just mention this, uh, there was some research on corn in uh, Mexico that actually fixes nitrogen from the air, 
right? And so that's a huge th discovery because that corn doesn't need chemical inputs at all. And there's an article in there about it. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, and then DeAndre or Taylor, if you have any um, suggestions of, or if not even just documentaries, just folks that um, people here might be interested in, in following up on. Oh my gosh, you know, there, there is a, there, there is nothing that comes off of the top of my head, but I also think that probably comes from it being the end of a long day and being slightly exhausted. So can I, can I get back to you, Mark Anthony, so that you can let, um, that you can maybe send something out to people? Certainly, we'll, we'll, um, we'll have this um, video recorded and then uh, whenever we get the, the list from, from you and um, Michelle and, and maybe Slayer, if he has any other recommendations, we can put that all together. Awesome. I, I will. I, I fully intend to. I just have to curate it because there's a lot of stuff that's out. There is stuff that's out there, but it, a lot, the stuff that I watched is from the 90s. And I don't know if it's really available like on, on the Internet today. It's like the thing that like we would watch it in my American Indian Studies class and like somebody would pop in a VHS tape. And so <laughs> see, see if that stuff is, is out there. Fair enough. And then Tlara, do you have any um, suggestions for folks that you um, are really um, interested in? So there's a documentary I watch, though this one is about mushrooms, not food justice. Sure. Um, there's a documentary called Fantastic Fungi. It got me interested in um, a lot of other mushrooms besides the two mushrooms that I usually grow. So it's um, a documentary by Paul Stamets. So it's a really fun documentary. I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. Awesome, we'll add that to the list. All right, um, and I think just to, to throw in um, for Colleen's second question, um, you know, when I, when I would teach the, uh, my cultural class, I would let the students, you know, think about, well, what if in a few years, if I were to tell you that um, the Buckeye tree is gonna be able to be grown in that state up north because of climate change, right? What does that mean to your identity? Um, I think just in terms of what DeAndre shared with us earlier, you know, what does that mean if the foods that are so attached to your identity are no longer a thing. At that point, I would think that people would start caring. Um, and so I thank um, Deandre for sharing that especially. Um, but with that said, I know we're, um, we've are we now gone past time. So I wanna thank everyone for joining us and especially to Michelle Talaria and um, Deandre for um, joining us on the panel tonight. I know it's been a, a long day, um, long week already it seems and it's only Tuesday. Um, but again, thank you all for, for joining us and thank you for everyone who's been um, you know watching these videos and um, taking part in the lecture series. Um, this autumn semester. Um, wish you all the very best. Have a happy Thanksgiving and um, time spent with friends and family. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And thank you for having us, Mark Anthony. All right. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you. Good to meet you.